Hey everybody, happy Sunday and welcome to another episode of The Trading Pit. We have four segments as always, two special guests. Segment one is going to be talking with traders with uh, our guest Steve Burns. We talk a little bit about how the market has evolved over the last 20 to 30 years and how Steve has really played that differently over the last uh, three decades. Segment two, broad market recap as always, SPY, QQQ, IDO, IWM and VIX. Segment three is finding an edge with Peter Pegadis, and we will be looking at some different ways that Peter likes to use the platform to find an edge in the markets. And then, as always, segment four to wrap it up will be weekend chart requests. We have 10 as always, so sit back, relax, and let's get started. All right, everyone, into segment one, talking with traders. We have a guest who has been on quite a few times before, and uh, we're happy to have Steve Burns on. Once again, founder of NewTraderU.com. And uh, Steve, today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how the stock market has changed in the last 20 years. This is a conversation that we've had a couple times in the past couple months, especially with all the craziness that's happened in the markets. And, you know, I just want to, one, thank you again for being on the show. And then, two, you know, just to give everybody a little bit of a background, when did you first start investing and in trading in the market and your interest uh, really? Uh, really was, uh, you know, spurred in the market. And, and when was that? So we can get an idea of, you know, how long it's been since you've been watching the markets and what's changed since then. Yeah, I interest started as a teenager. So I remember the 1987 crash on the news, even though I was in high school and I was too young to actually trade and have an account. And I started looking at compound capital growth tables uh, when I was about 17 or 18 in the late 80s, probably 80, 88, 89. And I didn't really get my first uh, investments until 1993 when I started buying into uh, some tech funds, mutual funds in 1993. So I go back about 27 years participating in the stock market in some way, shape or form. And I've evolved over the last about 27 years, you know, investing, looking at value investing, uh, growth investing, uh, trading, actively trading, I did some day trading and swing trading and trend trading and traded options and equity. So I've done a little bit of everything over the last 27 years. So I got pretty good, uh, array of uh, interest and experiences and education in the stock market. All right. So we're pretty much talking about 27 years until now and, and what the differences are. So, you know, I guess from obviously when the market crashed in the last four or five months, um, you know, it was a big deal on the media, on, on the news, in the media, whatever. Obviously, we have social media now. Was it a, as big of a deal in 1987 as it was? Yeah, as it was made out to be in March when we were crashing. Yeah, in 87, from what I remember being young, it was uh, more of a not understood what caused it. It was just a sudden drop of a of a one of the biggest drops ever. It can never even happen again. It was over 20 percent drop in the SP 500. But that was before they had circuit breakers and had other uh, things. A lot of it. Uh, hedging was started in the futures market and they blamed program trading and computer trading back then. But it wasn't as clear cut as the pandemic or the financial crisis or the dot com and 9-11 meltdown. This was a very, very fast. I think it's, this was the fastest uh, bear market, 20 percent correction in history, followed by the fastest rally in history. So it compressed what used to take two, two, three years into just uh, two or three months. So the speed is the biggest difference I saw and trying to price in the fundamental factors of an economic worldwide economic shutdown. So a lot different than the 87 and the dot com uh, and the 2008 financial crisis. Do you think interest rates had something to do with that? Maybe, you know, now interest rates are so low, people immediately cashed out, but then they realize they have to put their cash back in because there's nowhere else to get a return. Whereas in the 80s, you know, the, the interest rates were quite higher. So do you think that played into it at all as well? Yeah, a big part of this is a search for yield. You don't get yields anymore on bonds, and uh, and there's not a lot of good dividend stocks because everything's run up so high for so long for a good uh, dividend yield. So there's a look for returns, and the search usually ends people in equity. So there's never been a time where the Fed has been so uh, uh, accommodative to monetary policy and interest rates and just trying to pump the liquidity into the financial markets and promising to buy whatever it takes. So municipal uh, bonds, state bonds, I think even some foreign bonds they've talked about, even ETFs of bonds. I mean, they're providing liquidity 
from the Fed like never before, like they're just keeping the stock market going no matter what, which is not unusual in election years historically, but there's never been such an easy monetary policy with, with rates this low for this long in history. So that is absolutely part of it, the search for yield. I think, uh, I, think I saw a recent article where the Fed was saying they were going to keep rates near zero for years at this point. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen, but uh, it is, I think a lot of people in the market don't understand the fact that, you know, everyone's like, oh, the market has to crash because we've gone up so much. And, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand the yield search. There's nowhere else to put your money. And, you know, if you, you can't just hold cash because it's getting killed by inflation. So, you know, it's almost a forced buying event. And then you've got a lot of people who, you know, want to be the next big short that have been trying to short the market since uh, 250 on SPY, you know, and, and they're getting squeezed out and the market just keeps melting up. So it's a mix of all these things. And uh, it's just fascinating to watch. Now, um, when you were uh, in the markets uh, in the 90s, was technical analysis as big of a deal as it is now? I mean, I know that there wasn't as many, there was probably no software that was available to retail traders, at least, to do technical analysis and get any type of an edge with the retail um, kind of side of trading. So um, was it you, were you using it at all back then when you first started trading? No, I mean, there were back then you had to mail in to get charts in the mail if you wanted some printed charts. And a lot of the people that trade, I didn't trade as actively. I was more of an investor back in the 90s. But the traders had to do bar charts, bar graph and draw their charts day by day if they wanted daily charts. You know, it was a wow. completely different ball game. It's amazing how what the professionals did even have what we have now back then. And a lot of the technical analysis back then was really just like the, the McGee uh, chart pattern book, you know, the all the classic chart patterns, the cup and hander, the uh, saucer, the head and shoulders, all that was just chart patterns. And the trends were more readable back then with the longer term chart patterns because they were cycles of accumulation and distribution in different stocks because mutual funds were buying and selling and, and creating uh, uh, positions. And a lot of that's changed with ETFs and index ETFs and the speed of transactions. And back when it was $50, $100 a trade, you know, you didn't have the activity you have now to move prices. You go zero trades, you can move a lot of prices for free. Back then, it was very expensive to move prices. So it was a lot more stability and less uh, price. It was very more, it was more stable in the 90s where, where trends moved in one direction or the other for weeks and months at a time. Yeah. And they're there just wasn't as many retail participants, if any, really back then. I mean, you really had to almost be rich to trade the stock market back back then. So, um, you know, was do you think that technical analysis, as it's so widely available now, has become a self fulfilling prophecy? You know, everybody sees the same chart and they see the same trend line breaking, and it, it almost just becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. Or they see a specific moving average cross occurring, whereas in the '90s. You know, you wouldn't see that until you got your mail, uh, your mail in chart. It, that was a huge edge. I think it was Ed Sakota who actually was back testing exponential moving average crossover sy systems on uh, punch computers back then. He had access to punch computers through a university and he was back testing moving crossovers. I think it was one of the 520. You know, Donchi and Richard Donchi did some work on that, but you had to have like multi-million dollar computers to back test if he had such an edge like you said when he was charting out and graphing out moving averages on graphs he could see the trend clearly but no one else could even see it so yeah, now you can see it in five seconds with trend spider so uh, the information is there and like you said it's it's just groups of buyers and sellers there's breakout buyers there's people that swing traders that sell into the breakout and that's all a chart is is a visual representation of the groups of buyers and sellers creating support, resistance, and trends. And that's something that won't change. It's just the speed and the quantity and volume of participants and their levels that has changed. Yeah. The, you know, it's, it's just crazy to think back. I mean, I even remember back in when I first started trading back in like 2004, 2005, it was like a steal if you could get a trade, just a, a one side of the trade for less than 10 bucks, you know, that was like a big deal. And now, you know, it's crazy for me to even think of paying five dollars to, well, you know, even anything at this point, almost every broker is free, which just essentially gives people more and more of a reason to buy and sell, buy and sell. Whereas, like you said, back in the 90s, maybe even the early 2000s, where, you know, if you if you bought something and you paid one hundred dollars in commission, you can't just go back and forth. 
for you know a couple times a day because you're going to end up paying thousands of dollars in commission. So you know as far as the commission structure goes, you know that's something that's really changed. And you know, do you think that's definitely increased the rate of kind of turnover of capital that people are trading and that type of thing? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the margin, the allowance for margin. And you look back at the old market wizards books and all the, the legendary day traders back in the 80s, you know, they were poor traders. You couldn't day trade from home in the 80s or 90s until Charles Schwab, you know, had the discount brokerage commissions. Like you said, finally made affordable to day trade and you had an internet connection, even though it was dial up and you had brokerage platforms you could trade from the brokerage platform. I mean, when I was in the early 90s, I was doing mutual funds. I went to the bank and buy mutual funds, or I was using a phone to uh, transact buys and sales in tech mutual funds in the 90s. I mean, it was even before we had, we didn't have internet widespread or even dial up early on. So, you know, so many people take for granted what we have now. Basically, we're all trading at a professional level with with simple tools with zero commissions. It's pretty amazing. One interesting thing is my broker, I, my, one of my uh, first trading brokerages uh, was a Bank of America Investments. They turned into Merrill, Merrill Lynch, acquired them. But back even back in like 2007, I had zero commission trades 13 years ago. And if wow. I had a certain with them in the in a retirement fund and with a check, if I kept a certain equity capital in the bank, they would give me free, uh, 30, 40 free trades a month. And that was basically all I needed as a swinger trend trader. So I've been, I've had everybody so happy with these zero commission trades and I've had at least 30 a month since 2007 with that. And, uh, and you just mentioned swing trading and, you know, I think there's a big misconception in, in the market that trading means that you're in and out within a day or within intraday with, and you know, there's different types of trading and you, do you think different types of trading have become more, you know, more prevalent. So for example, you know, people probably weren't day trading as much as, and, and this is probably just in general, right? You know, if you're paying crazy commissions, you're, you're paying, you know, uh, you're essentially paying to play. And now, you know, you, uh, you don't even have to pay anything to get in in the morning, get out in the afternoon. So do you think, you know, that whole, that whole aspect of just, uh, you know, having uh, free trades allows you to um, almost be, I don't want to say a worse, uh, like, I think the ability to trade as much as people can actually has made people worse traders, at least people who, d who can't handle their emotions and, you know, want to, ca you want to chase stuff. You know, I think back in the 90s, it was a lot easier to make, you know, money, or I don't want to say make money, but you, you came up with an idea you had conviction on the idea, you paid your $200 in commission and you <laughs> sat in it. And now people are like, well, it hasn't happened in two days. I'm getting out. I'm trying, I'm going to go use my opportunity cost in somewhere else. You know, there's always an opportunity cost. And some people forget that just because you don't get an alpha within one day, that alpha that you get maybe in a week is going to make up for those five days that you didn't make any alpha. So, you know, I think that's something too, that people don't realize is, Trading does not mean you have to sell the next day or you don't have to buy in the morning and sell in the afternoon. Trading can easily be just position trading or swing trading. And, you know, I think a lot of people have kind of forgot that that is very much a way to make money in the market as well because of these zero commissions. And it, it, it's just almost because at the end of the day, brokers are making money now based on the spreads. They want you to trade a lot because they're taking a, a micro percent off of every trade that you're making on that $0 commission. So they're, they're almost making you want to trade more when really you should probably be trading less. Yeah. And they have to look at you know, successful day traders. You know, it's, there's you know, Marty Schwartz. He, he made multi, multi millions day trading, one of the most successful day traders back in the eighties, but he was a poor trader. Day trading is still a relatively new thing. Uh, it's not, it's not something that's been going on for a very long time. And uh, Warren Buffett did a uh, great, for uh, as an investor for 70 years. And a lot of the trend followers bought the uh, Boston Red Sox through trend following. So uh, a lot of this is a new uh, a new thing with this day trading. And it hasn't existed as an industry for like 25 years. And like you said, all the money I've made, the large compounding of capital I've gotten in my investment accounts and brokerage accounts over the last 27 years uh, came from letting winners run. Letting, you know, I was sort of like the Bitcoin hodlers are nowadays. I was that way with tech in the 90s. I just got tech mutual funds and just, and put them in an account and just watched them grow for year after year and compound and compound. And, uh, you know, I started more trading around 2000. I started looking at my uh, 
some retirement accounts thinking, you know, I need the time to stuff get in and out and not be hammered with a, like a dot com 911 situation again. And that taught me to get more into trend trading and swing trading. But, uh, you know, that's where the big money is, is catching big wins. It's hard to do that if you're trying to catch a day alpha or a couple of days alpha. Like you said, the big money comes from the big moves, and they still happen. People still get on one side of a market and stay there, as we've seen from this B bottom and a lot of this recent tech activity. It's crazy. Now, you know, we talk about what's happened over the last 27 years. Do you think there's been a very big change in how the, mar the market's acting over the last six months even? Compared to what we were dealing with, let's say in 2018, 20, you know, 2015, when we had the uh, the slight breakdown uh, with the oil markets, yeah, do you think you know this has gotten to a point where it's almost uh, euphoria, or are are things just getting faster because the computers are faster, more people have extra cash through the stimulus, whatever the case is? Do you think over the last six months since coronavirus has hit, the market has even changed a bit? Yeah, it seems like the advent of Robin Hood with bringing in all the players with zero commissions and really not understanding how things work, and they're technically driven. You can really see that with a complete disconnection from fundamentals. Even, you know, for years, Amazon trying to project and discount sales and earnings for 20 years ahead. And, and we see with Tesla now, with you're trying to price in the most it could ever be worth if it conquers the world, and it's a disconnection from any fundamentals whatsoever. And uh, yeah, I think we see that in the speed is so fast. It's all technical. There's Robinhood traders that will go in and pile into a bankrupt company, a company that's bankrupt, and it'll multiply double and triple and quadruple the price, and it's bankrupt. The equity is worth nothing. 99.9% .9 of all bankrupt companies, the equity goes to zero and wipes out shareholders. And then you see it double and triple in price. I mean, it's no connection whatsoever with reality from a fundamental standpoint. It reminds me of uh, giving you a tulip or something. <laughs> the greater fool, the greater fool theory is a real thing and you know for those that don't know what the greater fool theory is it essentially means that just because you're buying something doesn't mean that you think there's value but you know there's a greater fool that could buy it in the future and that's why you're buying it so you know are we seeing a little bit of that maybe but i think as we talked about at the beginning this is really just a search for yield and just an absolute um kind of squeeze of people who have been bearish in the market and then on top of that just the, the liquidity uh, from the Fed has just been fascinating. I mean, even back in uh, 20, uh, 2008, 2009, that was kind of when I really got my hands uh, dirty with uh, the market. I, I blew up a few accounts in, in uh, eighth grade. And then as, as <laughs> high school came on, uh, I was able to make uh, you know, some of that back. But um, the, the point is, is you know, I just don't remember these types of moves, at least in tech. You know, tech is one of those things that has just absolutely exploded. You know, there's got to be a point where tech does. And, the, and remember, right, if people are chasing yields or chasing dividends, dividend, the dividend yield is a function of whatever the price is. So the prices are going to get to a point where they're so high that the yield is going to drop. And then that's when people are going to start looking and say, eh, well, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to keep my money in the market. But at this point, people are forced to have their money in the market just to get some type of yield. And, uh, you know, Steve, it's been great talking to you and, and hearing your thoughts on how this whole thing has changed over the last uh, quarter century or so. And, um, you know, uh, we always uh, appreciate you being on the show and hearing your wisdom about the markets and, and how you trade them. And uh, really thank you again for uh, coming on and talking a little bit about this with us. Thanks for having me, Jake. Hey, you're very welcome. Once again, everyone, Steve Burns, founder of NewTraderU.com. And uh, Steve, we look forward to having you on again. And uh, we will move on to the next segment. All righty, everyone. Into the broad market segment, we're going to look at SPY, QQQ, IWM, and VIX. We are going to do a, a little bit of a double analysis on SPY here. So first of all, we're looking at the daily versus the weekly. You can see in the weekly here, we've defined this pretty uh, symmetrical um, channel here. There is a little bit of maybe broadening on the, uh, the resistance here, but for the most part, it looks pretty parallel. But what I've done here is I've also added another middle line here that has clearly acted as, acted as both support and resistance on the way up here. And this would be the next area of interest above if the price continued to move up into the week ahead. Now, one thing that I really want to touch on, everybody was talking about this, you know, bearish candle uh, on Thursday, 
And if you look at the, uh, and you know, we'll get to the weekly here in a second, but if you look at the raindrop versus the, the uh, hollow candle, you'll see something really interesting. You'll see that even though it looked like, you know, this was an indecision doji on the hollow candle, you'll see that we did have a lot of the volume aggregating at the top of the range, which told us buyers were still absorbing supply up here. Even though it looks like we sold off, which we did into the close, buyers were definitely aggregating and uh, absorbing supply at the top of the range here. And, and that's why we did have a continuation up on Friday. So, you know, don't let your emotions and your opinions uh, make your trades. Let the charts tell you what's going on. And this is a great example of raindrops really doing that for us. So going into the weekly chart, we are going to see uh, the Bollinger Band still just uh, really telling us this is getting a little sketchy, got to admit. Uh, we are way outside of this monthly upper band here. Uh, and notice any other time that's happened, we have had quite a move down afterwards. Uh, this is kind of musical chairs right now. Uh, you know, whenever the musical chairs stop, uh, the game's over. But for now, we are still moving up pretty solid. And we pretty much just melted right up to 350 this week. So um, going into the queues, you can see here that uh, we do have this pretty uh, interesting set up this is more of an ascending wedge here rather than uh, spy was but you can see here that we are nearing the top of this resistance area we are kind of right in the middle of this uh this ascending uh wedge so you know we'll have to see what happens but we're just kind of right in the middle uh between support and resistance here same thing on the weekly you can see uh quite a bit of uh, ex uh overextension here on the weekly qqq chart uh remember that the price can just continue to ride up along the band and the band can continue to move up. So just because this is outside the band now, remember when the monthly candle closes, this band could continue just to move up with price. So, um, you know, it, it, it looks scary, but there's other alternatives to this as well. So going into IWM, which just looks like an absolute possible explosion into next week and, you know, uh, that's just based on the chart. I'm not saying that we're going to explode next week, but, uh, I have seen setups like this that have had some pretty big moves to the upside. We're breaking out of the symmetrical triangle. Uh, last week, we were talking about how the price action was respecting this anchored VWAP from this June, uh, excuse me, July 31st capitulation point before the continuation up. And we really have been respecting that zone multiple times over the last week and then finally had a little bit of a push on Friday. Now, looking at the weekly chart, you can see here that, you know, we do uh, have the the monthly Bollinger Bands overlaid and we're nowhere near the upper band here. So is risk on still uh, and is risk uh, kind of risky assets in the IWM going to take us higher? We'll just have to see. But if we turn off MTFA, we were talking last week about this previous area of resistance acting as support. And that's exactly what it did this week. The, uh, the previous resistance here, and I kind of did double trend lines, has now been support multiple times. Last week we bounced here and then this week we uh, moved down and then pushed up uh, into the end of the week. So definitely something to look at and kind of an inside week here for IWM. Going into VIX, if I can spell VIX, um, we can see that VIX did have a weird week. We were moving up with VIX, with the broad markets for most of the week. And then finally Friday, there was a little bit of a pullback here. And then you can see here that this gap below is still not filled. And that's what a lot of people I think are watching into the uh, weeks and months ahead, especially into elections. So all in all, pretty strong week for the broad markets. A lot of people still are convinced that you know the market's gonna crash, but a lot of people keep forgetting that interest rates are pretty much at zero and there's nowhere else to put your money. Uh, so that is something to always remember that you know money's gonna flow where you can get a return and you're not gonna get a return just holding it in a, in a CD or a bond right now. And that's why the big money is really in the market still. So that is the broad market recap. We'll look at more charts in the chart request segment and uh, let's move on. Hi everybody, this is Finding an Edge and today our guest is Peter Hegedus. Peter, welcome. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for being here again. And uh, you've been on before, so it's, it's great to have you on the show for, yeah. for a second time. Um, this segment is called Finding an Edge, and this is all about how you trade. So, um, you know, let's let's jump into that if you're okay with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. So um, how long have you been trading, Peter? 
Oh, yeah. I've been investing for probably 20 plus years, but I've been a very active trader for about five years. Okay. So and about you... five years ago, I went from a guy who's kind of an active investor managing my own IRA and 401k and all that good stuff and some money of my own to having this crazy idea that everything doesn't have to be buy and hold and there's actually money to be made on much shorter time frames. How did you, um, how did you come to that realization? You know, most people, uh, most people only buy and hold. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny story because it's, it's a realization I came to on my own. Um, but I wasn't quite sure how to execute it. And then eventually I found a trading service, um, who I'll leave unnamed, who made it sound really easy and, had some early success, but then as I think with everyone who comes to a service that's just focused on alerts and not education, um, had, had some terrible experiences. And over time, I was able to find the right mentors, get the right education, and really learn how to dial in on a process of finding good setups with great risk reward. Do you, um, do you tend to trade swing or do you tend to day trade? What's your style like? I, I do both. If I had if I had my druthers, I would be swing trading probably ninety percent and day trading ten percent. Uh, but the way this market's been the last couple of years, I find myself probably about sixty five seventy percent day trades and and about you know thirty percent swing trading. Do you tend to um, do you tend to focus on options or futures or or equities themselves? I am, I am almost primarily, an, um, almost exclusively an options trader now. So I started okay. with equities. I learned equities. Um, I, I think it's critical for anyone learning how to trade. If, if you can't trade stocks, don't even bother trying to trade options yet. Uh, but if you go through the learning process, options, I think, are a great way to get excellent return on investment. It's a great way to manage risk, uh, particularly if you like to trade in both directions, which I do. I like to trade both to the long and the short side. Um, but trying to hold anything short overnight in equity is extremely dangerous, whereas it is. Options, you can manage your risk. Um, and the other big thing for me, um, you, know, you know, it's interesting. I think every trader over time starts to find some, some flaws they have and, and you work to eliminate those flaws. I actually went exclusively options because if I, 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 I went through my journal over a long time and if I ever had really bad days, it was usually the result of overtrading. Um, so I ended up going to an options only and taking margin off my account. And boy, that really, really makes you think about getting the best setups and not overtrading. That makes a lot of sense. Um, do you, uh, uh, when, when you're, when you're trading options, do you do spreads or do you just do straight directional bets? I use the kiss method. I, I, I keep it simple, stupid. And by stupid, I, I mean myself, um, but I just do buy to open calls, uh, buy to open puts. And the only thing I will do sometime in, um, typically I'll do that more in my long-term account, not my trading account, is sell covered calls. Okay. Yeah, I love selling covered calls. Actually, that's what got me into technical trading in the beginning when I first, you know, was learning about, about it. I was holding a lot of stocks and things are kind of going down and I'm like, I don't want to sell, but I really don't want to hold either. What, what's the yeah. middle ground, right? Um, so, uh, when you're, when you're trading or when you're looking at a setup, um, do you use any particular indicators? I do. I do. I'm, I'm almost purely a technical trader and I use a lot of different moving averages. Um, I've got some simple moving averages. I use some exponentials. And to me, what's really important about indicators is never trust just one, um, Anytime I'm looking for a trade, I want to see multiple things line up for me, right? I want to see uh, a nice relationship between moving averages, but I also want to see uh, maybe a key anchored VWAP level, or I want to see expanding volume coming in. Um, and then another really big one for me is I'm, I'm just a very big fan of the TTM squeeze indicator. Uh, that's um that's one that I get asked about a lot. Um, maybe you could share your screen and um, you know show us around uh, the TTM indicator and how you use it, and maybe show us some of the charts you're looking at. Absolutely, awesome. So Dan, this this is an example of something I look for um, in all my charts with a TTM squeeze. You can see here, this, these red dots here are telling me that we are in what we call a squeeze. And basically, you know, all that is, is it's the relationship between the Bollinger Bands and the Keltner channels. 
And when they, when they pinch inside each other, uh, it, it's a sign that the stock or the chart is building energy, um, which can release either way. But then you also have these momentum indicators. So you can see as these orange bars are declining up towards what we call the zero line, where your, your little red or green dots are, that stock is showing you positive momentum. As they come back, it's showing you negative momentum. In this case, this is Canada Goose. And you can see it's been in a really long squeeze here, um, really since the beginning of July. And after a couple kind of kind of false breakouts where you can see it ran into some anchored VWAP levels that it couldn't deal with, then popped over, couldn't hold, it came back and is now pushing back up through that zero line. And look what it did yesterday. It pushed through that anchored VWAP, it pushed off a shelf of anchored volume and yeah. something really important to me for all charts, it's got room to next major resistance. So if I go back to this major high that I've got the anchored VWAP anchored to, I've also got my 200-day um, moving average up here. This is a chart that has a ton of room. It's building energy for a big move, and it's got a really nice anchored volume profile here. So these are the types of things I look for. This is something I, I entered personally yesterday on the break over um, that anchored VWAP level. And, um, you know, I think if this can really start to pull away from 24, you're going to see a big move. The other thing that's super interesting about this one, um, and, and I'm starting to have a lot of fun with this TrendSpider feature, is although it's only got three years of history, Goose is green 100% of the time in September, which is a couple days away. And the yeah. average gain, I, 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 I don't have the seasonality tool up right now, but the average gain is something like 14, 15% in September. No kidding. So, so when, you, when you think about that, you've got a beautiful chart, you've got this nice TTM squeeze, you've got expanding volume here, you've got, you know, and this is another thing I like to look for. I wanna see big volume bars on the moves up, I want to see small volume bars on the pullbacks and now expanding back up on the push up. And we're going into winter coat season and seasonality tool says September is probably going to be a really good month for a uh, winter apparel brand. No kidding. It's funny. I was in uh, I was in goose. Um, I bought it early in the middle of that squeeze and I gave up on it like a few days ago. Now I'm thinking of yeah. getting back in. <laughs> Yeah, one of, uh, one of the key things I look for and I scan for, so so just, you know, if you if you get in like someplace here, I don't want to see that momentum bar coming down. I've actually written my scans on the TTM squeeze so that I only see um, increasing momentum. Actually, you can see I have my scan up right there, my TTM up increasing momentum scan. Interesting. Is um is TPM the main indicator that you use? Because I see a lot, I see, I see some moving averages and, uh, you know, other lines on your chart. Yep, I, I use I use a number of moving averages as well. Um, I'm always interested in the relationship between the EMA three and the EMA eight. Um, very rarely will I ever enter a stock where the three is below the eight. I want to see the three push up through the eight. Um, we also are big fans of the Trader's Path when we see a TTM squeeze and we see what we call a three eight twenty cross, meaning our three has crossed up our eight and our eight has crossed up through our twenty. That's one of our favorite um, entry signals. And, and honestly, we use it in both directions too. You can get a 3820 cross down and it gives you usually a really clean short signal as well. That's that's an interesting interesting combination of averages. I haven't heard of people using a three yeah. average combination in that way before. Yeah, and and you know we, we teach in our room because I know a lot of people would use a 510 or a 48. Um, I've seen all sorts of combinations. Really the key is, um, you know, I've experimented with a number, a number of them, and I just, I like that three eight the best, but it's, it's a matter of a really short term EMA crossing over a pretty short term EMA. And it doesn't have to be always that same one. You know, we have people in our room who trade a five ten, and it works great. So why, why did you choose three and eight? Um, yeah, like a five and a 10 makes sense to me, right? Five is a week and 10 is two weeks, right? I, I actually sometimes use five, 10 and 15 to get one, two and three weeks. Um, why three and eight and 20? I, I found when I went a little bit higher up, I would miss a lot of moves. Okay. 
So having that having that lower time frame being that much shorter, less than half of the eight, a little bit less than half, a lot of times we we catch that that three eight move um, a little bit sooner. Okay, and are those not are those um, is a TTM and the three eight twenty consistent if you're day trading or swing trading? Yeah, absolutely. We use it all the time. Uh, any time frame. All any time frame. Absolutely. Okay. Right. So we, for example. Um, Facebook is an interesting one here. This is one, it's, it hurts me a little bit to look at it um, this week because I sold it on Friday for a really <laughs> nice game. Um, but this was something um, that beautiful. I had alerted in our, in our, um, to our members on the hold of this anchored VWAP, right? So it had this gap up on earnings, pushed up, lost that, but then just started to consolidate so nicely Again, here, you've got that high volume on the move up, volume declined, but it held that anchored VWAP level and got in there. But at the same time, and let's see if I can actually find this, um, it had beautiful TTM squeezes on other time frames, right? So here, uh, let's see, it would have been, I think back in here. Yeah, look at this TTM squeeze on the 30 minute chart. Yeah, and uh, like a week ago, a little bit, and then just started coming up and going above that zero line, and look at the move that started. Okay, so will you will you explain on this chart how you would use the TTM? Like, when would you buy? Would you buy when the the squeeze turns off, when it goes red to green, or would you buy during the squeeze? I want to buy during the squeeze, uh, but I want to see really good upward momentum, right? So okay. This, was a good example. I had good, good momentum coming to the zero line, but couldn't get through. Here, upward momentum came up through the zero line and then kept building. So that was a, a good entry sign for me. And then you can see it fired long and actually just continued on. And as I said, looking at it this week's a little painful for me, but uh, it was it was an over over 100% winner for us on the on the calls last week. So I really can't complain about that. That's a beautiful chart. Um, are you are you looking at any other charts with the TTM that are kind of setting up aside from Goose? Let's see what else we're looking at here. Save is um, that's a Spirit Airlines. Yeah, yeah, this is an interesting one, but it's not quite. Um, you know, it looked really strong momentum pushing up towards the. Actually, this is a thirty. Let me go to our daily. Um, But you can see on this one, it's pushing up over that zero line. Also, again, we, we never just want to enter because there's a TTM squeeze. For me, TTM squeeze gets my interest. Then I want to see what else is happening. I want to see what the volume profile looks like. And I want to see what my moving averages are doing. Uh, I noticed there's no trend lines on your charts. Uh, I, I'll use those occasionally, but I'm usually more, more of a moving average guy than a trend line guy. Okay. Uh, day trading a little bit different, but... Uh, swing trading, I'm, I'm usually looking more at these, these moving averages, my anchored VWAPs, the volume shelves. You can see just a really nice shelf here on save, you know, and this is, this is a good example where it came down to anchored VWAP support as well as moving average support. So I had two things to like there. And then I had TTN pushing up off that, um, up off the zero line. So you can see it made a nice move. I actually tweeted about this one yesterday saying, you know, right from one anchored VWAP to the next, sure enough, this, this one is still acting as resistance. So we'll see if it's going to have any more energy left, but that, that's the type of things we look for all the time. Got it. How do you set a profit target on something like this? I almost always set my profit targets at resistance. Okay. Um, so Something something like save, if I enter here, I'm probably going to take some profit at this anchored VWAP. If I get through anchored VWAP, I'm probably going to look for, you know, a previous high or um, in this case, there isn't one. I'd be looking for some sort of volume shelf, overhead supply, um, always looking to resistance for my profit target. Now, of course, there's going to be cases like Facebook here where you, you can't do that. You have to, you have to do CRM that. is another one where I don't even know how you set a profit CRM target. Was, was, in, was insane today. Um, really, really wild. But uh, I, I can show you some day trades we took today, you know, which, which are a little bit different. 
you know, we're we have, a, we have a, a, a diverse audience here. There's a lot of swing traders that, that watch the show, but there are a lot of day traders who don't want to hold anything overnight. So, yeah. So Novavax was a really interesting one. We took uh, pretty early today. It didn't have a squeeze, but I did like the uh, momentum profile here coming up to the zero line as it went red to green. And then it gave me that 3820 cross. And on this trade, this great example of where we set our targets, this is the 200 period moving average on the five minute chart. We took first profit there. It held the EMA eight, so we stayed in the trade. And then it popped over the uh, daily SMA 50. So we, we took the rest of our profits here on these wicks. Uh, it's a beautiful trade. We got, we got about five, $6 out of it. Very cool. That's um, it's a beautiful setup, actually. I, I traded NVAX a long time ago. And it just, I mean, I think it traded at half the price it's at now back then. Yeah, it's going to uh, be one to watch tomorrow. If you look at this, um, is, a, is, it, is, there a, is this a Corona stock? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They're, they're, they're a vaccine name. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. I made the mistake of shorting, or not shorting, I bought puts in INO, which is another uh, Corona vaccine stock and, you know, totally got destroyed in that trade. Yeah. Well, they've all been, they've all been pulling a little bit recently, although Moderna made a big move today on some news. And that's the other reason we kind of had our eyes focused on Novavax as we thought it might follow Moderna up, which it did. But this is one we're going to be watching for day trades tomorrow as well. It's got a five minute squeeze into the close. It's holding, so you can see this SMA 200 was kind of rough resistance. It couldn't pull away from it, but look how it pulled back over it into the close and is holding it. Um, it's beautiful. I think do it's you use the do you use volume profile a lot? Not as much uh, day trading. I tend to just watch more the the actual volume bars, uh, but Got swing it. trading absolutely. I, I have no interest, almost no interest in a swing trade if there's not a, an anchored VWAP or um, anchored volume by price reason to be in the trade. Makes a lot of sense. It doesn't, if, if I see a chart I like and the anchored volume does not support my thesis, I, I throw it out and I move on to the next setup. Interesting. Do you, um, so I, I'm just guessing because I, I just by what, the way you're talking, but are, you're, you're much more of a buy low, sell high type of guy or do you, do you sometimes buy high and sell higher? Um, yeah, day trading, absolutely. Swing trading right now, so, so this is, this is just a kind of a philosophy for us that we talk to our members about all the time. Um, we hate trading bake breakouts on a swing trade when the market's constantly on all time highs. Um, it's just better to trade a pullback. Us, it's just served us well because one little market pullback like this one here, or certainly like this one here. Uh, your breakout is never going to work. We are, we are much bigger proponents of wanting to um, follow the trend, right? So we, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to try to pick bottoms. We want to follow the trend, but we love finding a stock that's in a pullback in a trend. And I can show you another example of that. And you can see that every once in a while, I do use trend lines too. Yeah. Uh, but we, we had a fantastic trade in Tesla. Um, which you can see is clearly in an uptrend, right? I think mm -hmm. anyone trying to short this name is uh, very frustrated right now, to say the least. They, they, uh, they, they, the Tesla shorts seem to be just gluttons for punishment. I mean, they just keep piling on. The short interest is always high and they always get destroyed. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably 18 months ago, two years ago, I made a lot of money shorting Tesla. Um, but, you know, boy, there just came a time where you had to say, why do you want to step in front of a moving freight train? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. But this was interesting. I, I, I found these trend lines um, kind of back in here, right? Just taking this high, this high, taking this low, this low. And you can see how it popped over and then came all the way back almost down to the trend line. As soon as yeah. we got that gap up and took out the 20 in a TTM squeeze heading up towards the zero line, I got in, trim some at anchored VWAP, ended up selling the rest uh, here in this candle. So I still missed a bunch of the move, but boy, that was that was one of the only thousand percent winners um, I've had in my career. That's that was awesome. that was just a beautiful, beautiful trade. It's a beautiful chart. 
Um, I, I love that style, right? Where you just try to buy close to support instead of yep. buying a breakout. Exactly. So we you saw know, an uptrend. We're not, we're not trying to, we're not trying to buy in a downtrend and guess the bounce. We identified an uptrend and said, we're going to try to buy the support of the uptrend. And if you're wrong, you've got a very clear risk level to get out at. Exactly. And that's what it's all about. And, and, you know, Dan, you, you probably see if I go to my, my weekly watch list, which I tweet about every weekend, um, you know, that's, that's really what it's all about for us. When we, when we look at charts, that's not the right one. Hold on a second. So I'm curious, do you tend to, um, are you one of those guys who only trades like a list of symbols, like certain stocks that you know, or are you, um, you one of those guys will trade anything with a chart that you like? I will trade anything with a chart that has liquidity. Got it. That's the big one for me. I'm not a big fan of small caps. Um, I tend to um, trade mostly mid and large caps. And especially as an options trader, I want to see really good liquid names. Got it. I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of you, man. I love the small caps. You know, find me a nice $100 million company with barely any float out there near support. And I'm like all in. So, so, my, so my, my, my business partner, Justin, uh, loves trading biocap small cap so we yeah. or biotech so we actually have a, a separate watch list just for you know for small t small cap biotechs with catalysts where we like to trade those into catalyst events and get out before they have yep. their the run-up the bio run-up right yeah it's, a, it's it's a it's like a bio run-up trade absolutely but um one thing i just wanted to mention if i you know i go to my watch list here this is from sunday it's my weekly watch list you know, th this is what every trade is about for me um you know, I want to see a risk to reward uh, at a minimum of two, you know, the closer to three, the better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something like Twitter, I didn't end up getting my entry because it gapped up on Monday and I don't want to chase it up there. I wanted to see it just uh, consolidate sideways a little bit or give a little pullback. Um, but that's, that's why, because if I, if I, if I chase the breakout and then get a big pullback to the 20, I'm in a lot of pain. Uh, but mm -hmm. if I can buy, buy closer to support, and then the chart breaks down, I keep my losses very small. It makes a lot of sense. Um, very cool. Are there, um, are there other indicators that you sometimes look at or is this basically it? Like, do you ever have an RSI in your chart or anything like that? I will look at RSI occasionally, but it's not a, it's not a big one for me. It's okay. not a big one for me. The, my, my, main, my main lower indicator that I just really rely on is the, is the TTM squeeze. Um, and then I follow my moving averages and, and volume. Beautiful. So, uh, Peter, I'm curious, um, in your words, what, uh, how would you describe, uh, uh, the trader's path and, um, you know, what makes it different than other, uh, other services out there? Cause I know there's a lot of, them, right? yeah, the, the, th the, the three things that make it different are education, education, and education. Okay. Uh, what do you mean by that? So Cause everybody we, says education. Yep. We came out of another service, um, and so so many services I had tried before that uh, the the one the one I had worked for in the past they're just focused on alerts right all everything their members are focused on and what they condition their members to be focused on is you sit by your machine and you wait for the alert and then you buy that stock and you hope and, and you wait until their sell alert basically and then and then their sell alert comes and the stock flushes and you wonder why you're actually selling at a loss instead of the win that the service got um we're big believers in education so for us it's more about you know we have we talked briefly about the ttm squeeze you know we've got probably four one hour plus lessons on how to use the ttm squeeze indicator and all the ins and outs of it um, we have a series we call chart college where we start from what does a single Japanese candlestick mean um, to what do two candlesticks together? How, how do, how do those relate? And then we get into candle patterns and ascending triangles and descending wedges and um, all the moving averages we use volume VWAP. We have lessons on your, your anchored volume tools, your anchored VWAP and anchored volume by price. And the great thing is, you know, I, I've got, um, you know, that, that goose chart is not a trade I alerted. It's actually a trade I'm in personally. I had multiple members all get in, in into that trade exactly where I did and have already started booking gains. And that's, that's, what, that's exactly what we want to be. We always tell our members, 
that if you've been with us a year, we don't want you to stay because you need us. We want you to stay because you like our community. That makes sense. Teach a man to fish, right? Yep, exactly. I, you know, we can, we, you, you can give someone a fish. And that's, that's honestly, in my opinion, the, the biggest problem with the, the trading community is everybody wants a shortcut and there are no shortcuts in trading. It's a 10,000 exactly. hour skill that you have to learn. Exactly. The best, the best story I, I actually heard, um, and supposedly it's a true story, was a um, trader, a Wall Street trader who went to go visit a um, surgeon friend of his out in the Hamptons. And he went out for the weekend, the doctor and surgeon invited him out there. And he says, hey, while you're here this weekend, can you teach me how to trade? And he said, absolutely. He goes, after I teach you how to trade on Monday, can you teach me how to do neurosurgery? <laughs> and, and it's, it's a true. process. You can't, you know, it's a process. You can't, you can't just step in and trade overnight. Um, you know, we try to make it easy for newer traders. We, we, we tend to alert what we think are a lot of pretty much kind of softball trades. We don't alert anything that's low float, um, that's gonna have chasing and you get bad entries. Um, you know, we try not to pick the bottom with our entries, right? So if I'm looking to enter Twitter on the 20, you know, I'm not gonna try to get a little tiny width down to it and then alert that trade when it's already shot up um, 50 cents. Yeah. We try to make it easy, but at the end of the day, if you, if you don't wanna take the time and learn, you know, that, that's really where you're going to have success is, is, is learn, learn all the ins and outs of technical analysis, learn all the ins and outs of the market, and then you can make your own decisions. Okay. And do, do you find, I'm just curious, um, just anecdotally, but, you know, since you, since you have an education service, um, do a lot of traders, you know, come in completely green and then graduate out, right, and just go off on their own and be profitable? We have, we've had quite a few Um who've come in very green. Probably what we've had more than anything though, is, is we've had a lot of people who were, who were like us and, and why we started the trader's path was we just didn't think there were a lot of great options out there. And um, I, I know there's, you know, we, we certainly have some folks in the industry who are fantastic, but there's so many who do heavy, heavy advertising, um, who promise quick, fast, easy riches. And we get so many people who come in and say, I used to have a you know, hundred thousand dollar account. I'm down to eighteen thousand. Can you help me? And we've had a lot of those people who we've got on the absolute right path right now. Hence the name, the Trader's Path, right? Exactly. That's that's why we chose it. We wanna we wanna help our members find their own path to profits. So well, very cool, Peter. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna have to cut this off. But um, you know, for those who, who are watching, if, if you want to get to know Peter, if you want to if you want to learn about the Traders Path, we'll put the links um, to both Twitter and, and their website in the description below. And Peter, thank you for being here. It's been it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, is there anything you want to leave leave the audience with before we cut off here? Only other thing I would leave everyone with is be careful going into tomorrow. We got a VIX that looks angry. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and for, for people watching, this is being filmed Wednesday at uh, 3.50 or so p.m. Central Time. So we'll see how all this works out when this airs on Sunday. Um, so thank you again, uh, Peter. And, um, you know, we'll hope you have, you'll be on again one day. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, Peter and Dan, for that. I always enjoy Peter's uh, analysis and perspectives on the market. So uh, let's jump in and see if we can look at some charts into the week ahead and uh, do as well as they did. Going into the first one, SQ. This was one that was requested quite a bit. So uh, obviously, it's a very popular one into the week ahead. We can see here that we are nearing the 1.618 extension. What I did was I measured a move from June 12th all the way up to July 8th. And you can see this 1.618 extension is almost acting as this perfect uh, ascending triangle resistance. And uh, will we break through it? We'll have to see. But on the weekly chart, doing a measured move from October 2018 down to March 2018, you can see that we have already cleared through that 1.618 on the longer term side of things. And if this did continue up, the 2.618 is around $211. Uh, that would be quite a move over the next few months. But it's the market. There's nowhere else to put your money. It wouldn't shock me at this point if this thing did just continue to ramp right up. Uh, but that's not for me to say. That's for the charts in the uh, market overall to tell us what's going to happen next. Going into JPM, 
Um, I do have to admit, I had to enter this one. It looks too beautiful going into the, the following weeks ahead. So full disclosure, I am in this one. Um, and, uh, you know, we are near the resistance up here from Friday. You can see, though, on the weekly chart, if we uh, scroll in here a little bit and then apply the volume by price, we can essentially see starting the volume by price from this top candle here, we can see what the volume distribution is within this symmetrical triangle. That's the beautiful thing about the anchored volume by price. We're able to anchor from the start of a pattern and see what's the volume distribution within that pattern. So in this case, we've got a lot of shares holding in this area, pretty much bounced right off of this area. We're right at the apex of the symmetrical uh, triangles well. And uh, this thing's going to have to go one way or the other. And uh, based on how much volume there is here and the size of this weekly candle, you know, I can only guess possibly to the upside. But like I said, that's not for me to decide. That's for the market to decide. And we'll just have to see what happens going into the week ahead. Now, looking at SLV, this is another one that I had to enter uh, this week. It just looked too strong. And uh, it wasn't necessarily based on the uh, daily chart, it was more based on the weekly chart, which we'll get to here in a second. But you can see here that we've got this pretty uh, broad symmetrical triangle forming, tried to break out of here on Friday, but did not. Uh, but what I was really focused on and usually am as a trader is on the weekly and the monthly. And so you can see here on the weekly chart, if we do anchor the volume by price from this March low, you can see that we are forming a little bit of a volume shelf here. And we have now tested this anchored VWAP uh, 20. 2011 high anchored view app uh, almost three times now. I did add a little bit of percent offset here. So uh, that is the reason why it's a little bigger than normal, but you always need to have some margin of error in the market. That's just how it works. Nothing's going to be precise. So uh, I did add some margin of error around here. We've got kind of this pennant forming and we'll just have to see what happens into the week ahead. Now going into SPCE, this was another one that was really commonly requested when I posted a, um, uh, just a post about what everyone wanted to see this weekend. And we're still kind of forming this very broad uh, rounded bottom here. And the question is, are we going to test the alpha trends anchored VWAPs above both from this gap down and from this high on July 23rd? We'll just have to see what happens. But, um, you know, the weekly candle is showing quite a volume shelf forming here. So you can see here that very similar to JP Morgan, we had a nice bounce off the volume shelf. Not necessarily the close like we had on JPM, but very similar setup here. And uh, we'll just have to see what goes on into the week ahead. But definitely uh, supply drying up and demand starting to kind of come around here. So this will be an interesting one to watch uh, in the week ahead. BYNB was one that I actually made a trade on this week. This uh, I usually never do this, but I, I was trading a little bit. Um, I, I did some trades while I was on vacation and then they... Uh, you know, flowed over into this week, uh, this week that I was working. So that's always fun. But uh, it worked out, right? We're looking at BYND. We're looking essentially at this anchored VWAP from the March low and anchoring the VWAPs and the volume by price from this uh, capitulation point. And you can see what happened here. I mean, almost textbook. Uh, you know, we, we were really, really tight within these two anchored VWAPs. You had this little volume shelf forming. You had a volume gap right here, which essentially allowed the price to gap up when they had their e-commerce news or whatever that was. And then what happens? We almost to the penny touch this uh, June, uh, June 17th anchored VWAP here and then pull back very strong. And you can see this was a supply zone above. Clearly, remember, all these people were holding at a loss. Once the price gets back up to this 136, 137 area, everyone's like, okay, I'm out. I'm moving my money elsewhere. And that's where you get this excess supply. And this is why we call that a supply zone. Now, looking at the weekly chart, we can see here that, you know, this is getting very tightly wound within this uh, kind of falling wedge, as you can see. And we didn't actually close through the falling wedge resistance. But, you know, this is getting very close to the apex of this, uh, this wedge. And we'll just have to see which way price decides to go. Uh, Boeing. Boeing's one that I want to touch on on a couple of different things, right? So one, we've got this very defined inverse head and shoulders here. And then you can see here on the weekly, if we anchor the volume by price from all time highs, you can see almost all of the shares are being held right within this general area. Now, what I want to do is I want to turn on the monthly chart because we are getting close to the end of the month. 
on uh, Monday's our last trading day of August, you can see here that we've got this huge volume shelf here. And not only that, but let's throw a little bit of seasonality in here and see that let's say since uh, you know 2010, 80% of September's have closed green in the last 10 years. So does that mean that we're going to close green next month? Absolutely not. But that tells us that we are entering a pretty bullish seasonal trend, not only into September, but October, November also have relatively high rates of positivity, meaning that you know 70% of October's and November's have closed green since 2010. So it's really nice to be able to use seasonality and technical analysis together to get an idea of what may happen in the market. So um, inverse head and shoulders on the daily, a pretty big volume shelf on the monthly here, and uh, we'll just have to see what happens. But let's go into SE. I don't even know if this thing, C Limited, I, I thought it was like a shipping company. Maybe it is. I don't know what it is, but a lot of people requested it, so we decided to put it on here. We're going to use a couple features that uh, I love on the platform, such as the gap detection. So notice here when I turn on the gap snake, all of these gaps show up below without me having to even highlight them. The system already knows that these are gaps in price and they're highlighting them here. So we have a few things to look at. We have the RSI divergence, which has really been diverging now for quite some time. That means that we're getting lower lows here on the RSI, excuse me, lower highs on the RSI, and we're getting higher highs on the price. So the two are diverging from each other. And, uh, you know, Based on that and the fact that the weekly chart is literally right at this resistance zone, we'll just have to see what happens going into the week ahead. But uh, we are at a, a area where you know things have cooled off in the past. Not necessarily means it's got a crash, but maybe it's just going to consolidate for a little bit. We'll just have to see what happens going into the week ahead. Uh, NKLA is another great one using the gap snake. So uh, you can see here that we did fill the gap on Friday. And uh, you know what do you know? We moved up right to that previous highs anchored VWAP on August 14th. So literally moved right up to it. You can see here that the gap did fill from this gap up on August 10th. And now it's trying to kind of reverse after forming almost like a, a bull flag here. Now on the weekly side of things, this is something that we've been watching for the last couple of weeks, this uh, longer term area of support. It did act as support here in late July. Now it's acting as support once again into late, uh, I was gonna say October, August. And uh, not, a, not a bad looking candle. We'll have to see what happens. Decent bounce here. But all in all, this has been respecting this longer term area of support pretty nicely over the last uh, couple of weeks, um, even a month or so more. So Netflix is another one that I wanna go over. And this is one that really goes over the Alpha Trends anchored VWAP pinch which uh, did decide to absolutely explode this week. And remember, what we do is we anchor the volume by price from this pivot point here. We then anchor the VWAP from this pivot. We anchor the VWAP from this swing high as well. And you'll see what happens. We've got this, not only this very strong pinch, but we also have this huge volume shelf forming within the pinch. And this acted as just an absolute launch pad. I mean, some people likely got pretty rich this week uh, trading Netflix with this type of candle if you were an option. So um, on the right side of things, we have the weekly chart. We did have a nice continuation. We talked last week about this candle looking pretty strong, very strong move up. And the 2.618 would be the next area to watch. Before that, obviously, you have to watch these previous highs here around you know 575. But in the long game, I'm sure a lot of people are looking at this 2.618 extension as a possible target above. Into the last one, Donkey Kong, aka DKNG, DraftKings, some people may know it as. If we anchor the volume by price from this swing high, you'll see here how well the price action respected these two uh, volume shelves here. One of these being a supply zone above, and then one of these being a demand zone below. And notice here how we pretty much were able to move very quickly through this volume gap. And then these two areas acted as a level of interest for both sellers at the top and then buyers down below. And then on the weekly chart, you can see we've got another Alpha Trends anchored VWAP pinch here, uh, literally closed right below this, uh, this June 1st anchored VWAP here. Uh, pretty, I mean, you can't make this up. It's almost a perfect respect of this line. And so the question is, which way will the price break from here? 
you know, maybe there's some sports news over the weekend that makes this go to the next level, but uh, we'll just have to see what happens. It is getting very tight here, though, and we'll just have to see if this is a continuation play or there's a pullback into the week ahead. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to sign up for a free trial if you have not already. You can try all of these features out that I just went over. And uh, everyone have a great start to the week and happy trading.